Dubesar, now you can start speaking. Okay. So, good morning, friends. Uh, it's indeed a very good moment for us that uh, Mr. Michael Cronin from Ohio, California, has joined us for a talk. Uh, Michael needs no introduction in Krishmuti circle anywhere in the world. But for those who are uh, not aware about Michael Cronin, I'll briefly introduce him. Uh, Mr. Michael Cronin was born in Germany at the end of World War II and grew up near Dusseldorf in the northwest region of the Rhine River. He graduated from high school, earning his baccalaureate in 1964 and immigrated to US the following year. He lived and attended college in Los Angeles, discovering and being fascinated by the mostly Asian religious traditions like Hinduism, Buddhism, Zen Taoism, Islam, and Judaism. He chanced upon some writings of J. Krishmurti, which fascinated him profoundly. In 1967, Michael traveled overland to India for the first time, exploring the various religious centers, temples, and monuments. While in Almora, in UP, he staying with the disciple of Ramana Maharshi in 1969. He learned that J. Krishnamurti was still alive and presented public talks in several locations. He was fortunate to have his first live encounter with Krishnji in Chennai in January 1971 at a dialogue event of Krishnji with younger people. This so deeply moved him that he endeavored to hear Krishnji speak wherever he could, in India, at the various locations in Rishi Valley, at Bangalore, Mumbai, Varansi, Chennai, and Delhi. In Europe, where he volunteered at the Brockwood Park School and in Sun and Switzerland. And then also in the United States, Santa Monica, Ohio, and San Francisco. He continued following K to these various locations for four to five years. It was 19, in 1975, that he was given the position of cook at the newly founded Oak Grove School in Ohio. During Krishji's regular stay in California from February through May, <coughs> he prepared lunchtime meals for Kay and his guests at the Arjvihar property, now the Pepper Tree Retreat. All of this, even though he was not a trained chef, but had to learn the culinary art from zero, but with the help of some great specialists. He pursued his activity for 11 years until shortly after Kismuthi's passing away in 1986. Subsequently, he wrote a book about his time with K, which was also published by Penguin India, The Kitchen Chronicles, 1001 Lunches with J. Kismuthi. Currently, Michael works at the, at the library of the, uh, as librarian of the Krishmuti Library in Ohio, California. So I want to extend a very warm to Michael for uh, being with us today and also want to thank him profusely on behalf of the uh, Krishmuti Study Center in Dhar that he accepted our invitation and is going to be with us today. Uh, Michael is going to talk to us on the theme, is it possible to live Krishmuti's teachings and what does this imply in one's daily life? I'll also make a request to Michael to please share some of your poems. Uh, one has appeared recently in the Frederick's newsletter and also your ode to Krishmuti. It was really a pleasure reading all those. So with these words, I welcome Michael once again. And Mike, you can start now. Please unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Unmute. Unmute. Unmute, Michael. Yeah, yeah. Now it's okay. Thank you very much, Sri Pati Narayan. I'm sorry this turns out to be a little bit complicated, <laughs> much more complicated than I thought, because the screen, actually some friend helped me set it up. Uh, and I thought it would be real easy, but it turns out to me much more complex. 
So forgive me for the delay and all that, but otherwise I wanna just express my deep uh, gratitude and uh, appreciation to meet all of you to, uh, because it's, you know, okay, we got used to uh, e -phone, uh, emails and, and iPhones and computers. And yet when you actually think about what it does, well, it's sometimes miraculous here. I see all of you here uh, more or less in visually, and I can hear Ripati Dubey and the other ones, of course, if they wanted to talk, I could probably hear them too. And so this is an extraordinary event. And in fact, I want to start here. There is a, a, a this, these are from talks that Krishnaji gave in 1980 in Sri Lanka. And there's one little passage that struck me profoundly. And I like to read it to you because I think it, it directly aims at what I was just saying about that connectedness over half the globe. We are connected at this moment and I feel it in my heart. You know, and so this is called the book of life. And the whole story of mankind is in you. The vast experiences, the deep rooted fears, anxieties, sorrow, pleasure, and all the beliefs that man has accumulated throughout millennia. You are that book, and it is an art to read that book. It is not printed by any publisher. It is not for sale. You can't buy it in any bookstore. You can't go to any analyst because his book is the same as yours. Not to any scientist, nor to any scientist. The scientist may have a great deal of information about matter, about astrophysics, but his book, The Story of Mankind, is the same as yours. And I thought that was a wonderful statement by Krishna G, and it contains the essence of uh, his teachings, because his teachings go there in a, in a certain sense, they are remarkably simple. And yet they go very deep and they cover this whole book of humanity that is, that is that we are, you know, all of us are humanity. So to continue this, actually, I like to read you a poem of mine. And I wrote that actually quite a while ago when I was in Portugal in 1989. So that's over 30 years ago. And I modified it two years ago here in Ojai. And it's called Ode to Krishna Ji. Sing through me, O muse, the story of the man who for decades wandered the boundless earth and crossed great waters to teach truth to humanity. Even as the world erupted in war and destruction many times, he abided in peace, love, and compassion. Nothing swayed him from the path of right action. What he said, he did. What he taught, he lived. He lived 1,080 moons. During that time, he traveled more than a million miles across the face of the planet, which he loved and cared for. He spoke but the truth, whether beneath the white branch tamarinds of Chennai, or the live oaks of Ohai, whether in the huge tent of Zanan, 
by the rushing mountain stream or the tent among the verdant meadows of Brockwood Park. Whether in the halls of London, Paris, Rome, Amsterdam, New York, or Santa Monica, in the Masonic Temple of San Francisco, in churches, universities, schools, and colleges of Puerto Rico, California, Mexico City, and Rio de Janeiro, all over Europe, India, and Australia, nothing but clear perception escaped his lips. And the multitudes gathered and listened in silence. Thousands of times, he engaged in profound inquiry and dialogue with the famous, the learned, the celebrated minds of the 20th century. He discussed the profound questions of daily life with teachers, students, and parents. He conversed with kings and princes, prime ministers, presidents and senators, with artists and scientists. He touched the mighty and the low. He touched the all of humanity without reservation. He transformed the essence and core of human consciousness on the globe. He founded seven schools on three continents, showing new and more creative ways of educating future generations. By being a light to himself, he was a bright light to those around him and to all humanity. He did not seek power, fame, and material wealth because he was free in an inmost way. He was able to divest himself of any tendency to dominate other human beings. There was no pretense or deception in him. When during many decades, thousands of people, one by one, came to see him with their problems, their sorrow and fear, he was a friend and a brother. He would not just say, be your brother's keeper. He was it most profoundly. He would hold your hand. And he was a mirror, clean, polished, crystal clear and bright, without distortion, without holding back, and you could perceive yourself as never before. He was without sentimentality about himself and the world. He did not make any claims of being a savior, a messiah, the Maitreya Buddha, even though at certain times he had been proclaimed as such. He did away with and denied all spiritual and religious authority both for himself and others, and did not tolerate being proclaimed as an authority of any kind. His worldwide public talks and dialogues were recorded, transcribed and published over 60 years, and translated into humanity's many languages. He walked in silence. He lived in vibrant emptiness. His long life resembled a fairy tale. It was full of magic, mystery, and beauty. And it was not without challenges and difficulties, but like a lovely flower on the banks of a mighty stream, he blossomed and spread his perfume for all humanity to cherish. He was a mystery, as life is a mystery, as the cosmos is a mystery, as each human being ultimately is a mystery. He liked mysteries and he clarified. So <laughs> I'm sure you probably knew all of that to some degree, but I, I liked putting it together as a song for Krishna Ji, uh, this marvelous person. And I'm sure uh, a few, or maybe most of you, or a few of you, you met him, you had interaction with him, and, and you know what an extraordinary presence he was. That's, that's the word to use. He was a presence. 
and that communicated itself. Now, what, what did he do giving talks, living his life fully, giving interviews and all that? And so we come to this, what he himself called the teachings. And well, what are the teachings? If you look at it, there's an enormous amount of material, you know. Actually, I was just looking at a, at a, a statistic of that. And they said he wrote eight on, well, or not he wrote, but there are 80 books that contain his words. You know, some of them he has written himself. Others are from the talks and dialogues. So is all of that his teaching or is the teaching more of the essence of what he was talking about, what he was hinting. And then you come to this when you, like most of us, are familiar with him, have studied his work for a long time. And then where, where does this become real and important in our daily life, right? And here now, he, at the same time, he made these statements, and I'm reading that now to you. The, these are Krishnaji's words. The person, Krishnamurti, is not at all important. What is important is that we investigate, examining, observe, and think clearly, not trying to understand the speaker but together understand what has happened to humanity, what is happening in the world and our relationship to it. <clears throat> and I think that's, that's uh, uh, the, an, an integral part of what he's talking about, his teachings, you know, to be aware of what is happening in the world, to observe it, possibly without judgment, and that's, of course, the thing we have to learn, to, to look and observe and see facts without judging them, without, you know, uh, saying good, bad, should be, shouldn't be, just to see simply the fact. And in that, we are humanity at that point. <clears throat> so, there's many other things that I like to present to you. I accumulated quite a bit, maybe a bit much, <laughs> but um, also I think uh, the teachings point at something else. And I'm sure again that you are aware of it, but I like to bring, bring that out because it seems to be very significant, deeply significant, because Krishna G really was an environmentalist, a person who loved nature and was connected to nature. And actually we can see that in this book, you know it, Krishnamurti to himself, his last journal. And I'd just like to read a short passage to you and because he starts out here in Ohio in 1983, and he says, there is a tree by the river, and we have been watching it day after day for several weeks when the sun is about to rise. As the sun rises slowly over the horizon, over the trees, this particular tree becomes all of a sudden golden. All the leaves are bright with life, and as you watch it, as the hours pass by, that tree whose name does not matter, what matters is that beautiful tree. An extraordinary quality seems to spread all over the land, over the river. And then he goes on. But then he, he, he makes, he points out something that is, um, that is significant. He says, if you establish a relationship with it, the tree, then you have relationship with mankind. You are responsible then for that tree 
and for the trees of the world. But if you have no relationship with the living things on this earth, and you, you may lose whatever relationship you have with humanity, with human beings. We never look deeply into the quality of a tree. We never really touch it, feel its solidity, its rough bark, and hear the sound that is part of the tree. Not the sound of wind through the leaves, not the breeze of the morning that flutters the leaves, but its own sound the sound of the trunk, and the silent sound of the roots. You must be extraordinarily sensitive to hear the sound. The sound is not the noise of the world, not the noise of the chattering of the mind, not the vulgarity of human quarrels and human warfare, but sound as part of the universe. And I think that's so accurate, and it hints very much at what Krishnaji uh, practiced and lived in his own life. He, he, he helped gardening, and, uh, and he, 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 he felt he was part of nature, of the universe. And I don't know if we do that. I mean, it's not simple to feel that way. You know. But here now, I'd like to read to you, if you allow me, I hope I'm not boring you too much. I, uh, I read this, and it's called I and Humanity. I wrote this here uh, 12 years ago. <clears throat> I and Humanity. I am all of humanity. Those whom I have met and known, they are within me not only as memory, as images, but also much more, something unspeakable. They contribute to what I am at this moment, all of humanity. And then there are those whom I have encountered only in passing from a distance, a multitude, not quite faceless, far from it, but who are the very fabric and substance of the many billions of entities that constitute humanity. They also are me. And there are those, both alive and dead, who built the houses, roads, and cities, who harvest the vineyards and field, who mine the deep earth and oceans, who construct pyramids and ancient monuments. All, all of them are within me, are me all of humanity. So, <clears throat> I don't know if we see that, you know, to, to have this daily contact. Actually, oh, here, here, apropos uh, the numbers, I just heard that they, they had it in the news that it was just a couple of days ago. I don't know how, this, how they get at this statistic. They said, Humanity had reached the number of 8 billion. There are now 8 billion human beings on the earth. And you know the quantity of those human beings living in India is more than an eighth. You know? So it's, it's remarkable. And I remember India. It's, it's a magical place. It, it has a spirit of its own. And it goes, you know, it has all the problems, of course, that the rest of humanity have. But still, it's a very exceptional place. And so now you are an eighth of humanity. You know, that's something extraordinary, I think. And what else? Let's see. Uh, am I uh, maybe... Shivapati can comment on what I'm doing and saying and presenting. Is it of interest? Is it okay? Yes, 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 Michael, please go ahead, go ahead. Okay, good. Then I find that Krishnaji in his, in his teachings, he, uh, he, uh, uh, well, sometimes, I mean, you may remember that, particularly in his later years, he was often 
I would say, very, not condemnatory, but very questioning, you know, and he questioned the result of his own work and writings and said, sometimes he would say, and I think he was just talking about the people around him, you know, that were close to him, and he said, nobody has understood what I said. <laughs> and he said that often, which I found peculiar and maybe not the best way of stating these things, <laughs> even though they may be true. But here, yeah, uh, I came upon a, I came upon a wonderful passage from one of his talks. And it's in the Collected Works, Volume 10. And it's an excerpt from a talk, or actually it's a question that was raised during your talk he gave in Madras, at that time it was still Madras, now it's Chennai. And it was December 23rd, 1956. So what is that? That's almost 65, yeah, that's 65 years ago. And a person uh, among the audience, he asks, you were born in a village of very poor environment. And you say that you have never studied the scriptures. What good karma has brought you to this liberation that Gita had just exhibited? And, and he's, he, he accepts the question by saying, this is really a very interesting question if you care to go into it. Not because it is personal, but apart from the person altogether. And then he goes on answering it to some degree. But then the thing that struck me and I found most poignant and significant is toward the end. He says, why does one particular mind that is put under pressure that goes through all the stresses and strains of life see so much and come out differently? What makes it happen? Is it like some rare thing in botany or in the field of sport? Or is it something which is possible for everybody? If it is a rare thing, it has no value. You can just as well put it all in a museum, label and forget it, which is what we generally do. Only we make the person into a saint or some silly thing like that. But if you really want to know, then you will have to find out for yourself whether there is a reality which can be understood immediately and not through the process of time. That's, I think that's a good question. And now he, he goes into it and he says, there is a reality, please listen sirs. There is a reality which coming upon the mind transforms it. You don't have to do a thing. I mean, this is extraordinary, right? It operates, it functions, it has a being of its own, but the mind must feel it, must know it and not speculate, not have all kinds of ideas about it. A mind that is seeking it will never find it. But there is that state unquestionably. In saying this, I'm not speculating, nor am I stating it as an experience of yesterday. It is so. There is that state. And if you have it, you will find everything is possible because that is creation. That is love. That is compassion. But you cannot come to it through any means, through any book through any guru or organization. Do please realize that you cannot come to it through any means. No meditation will lead you to it. When you realize that no sanctions, no pattern of behavior, no guru, no book, no organization, no authority can lead you to that state you have already got it. Then you will find that the mind is merely an instrument of that creation. 
And it is that creation operating through the mind that will bring about a totally different world. Not the planned world of the politician or the religious social reformer, because that creation is its own reality, its own eternity. So I must tell you, you know, I came upon that. I mean, I haven't read the whole collected works, but I read in a significant part of it. But this struck me so profoundly. And I made a copy of this last statement and I carry it with me. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, not like I read it every time, but I, I thought it was so poignant, so direct and so meaningful. You know, and it, and he's saying something really. Uh, I mean, it's you see, it comes to that point where it appears like a contradiction and a paradox, because here, here he's talking about the teachings, wanting to free the human being, and there he says, no, no authority. And I have no authority here. That's why he says so. You know, you cannot use him as an authority, as a guru, as a you know. I mean, well, but you see, at the same time, for me at least, he was a presence, he was a teacher, he showed something that I never saw before. He opened a window, as it were, and I saw a land of freedom, of beauty. And it's still there, you know, not all the time, because I've got problems. I, life, with all its complexity, is there. One has to cope with it. And you know how difficult that is. But in coping with the complexity and the challenges, one learns. And as at the moment you leave it, at a certain point, so you're free of it. That's extraordinary. You know, that's really extraordinary. So um, let's see, I don't know how much more time we have, but um, maybe I'll read you another poem of mine. <laughs> I used to write poems uh, for Krishna G and about Krishna G. And I used to give him the book. I remember, you know, I mean, here I have a little booklet that I make a strong part. It's a self-made book and it's called Journeys of the Mind. 33 poems for J. Krishnamurti. You know. And <clears throat> I gave that to him. And he said, he asked me, can I take that with me to, you know, I was staying in the in the Ar Arya Vihara house, and he was staying in the Pine Cottage, where Mary Zimbalist hosted him and looked after him. And a day or two later, he, he returned the poems. And he, and, and he always used to come into the kitchen first, right? And, and said goodbye and said, hi, uh, I'm not goodbye, hello. And he, and he said, what's for lunch, Michael? <laughs> and sometimes looked in the pots. <laughs> and, but on this occasion, he, he, he returned this book with the poems and he put it down. And then he said, and I wasn't sure whether he was, um, how should I put it? Uh, whether he was ironical or meant what he said, or, but he was lighthearted. That was a beautiful thing about him. He had a wonderful sense of humor that attracted me to him, you know, that he was telling jokes and liked to laugh at his whole situation, at everything, you know. And I thought that was great. Anyways, he returned these poems to me and as he put them down on the, on the cover, on the um, on the table there, and he said, you are quite a poet, so, <laughs> and he said it in such a way, I could almost uh, take it as irony, you know, hey, you are quite a poet, but it, well, there it was, he had read the poems, and, and I kept writing a lot of them, you know, and so, um, Actually, now I, I want to interrupt myself briefly and again ask Sripati, how are we doing with time? Uh, 
Michael, you can you can maybe talk up to uh, maybe another ten minutes, and then okay. we and then we leave it for the people to ask questions. All right. Uh, I have I have two requests to make. One, if you could read your poem, the inner landscape, if you have a copy of it. The the what? The inner landscape. Your poem, inner landscape. You don't have a copy. It does. It's, I don't even remember the title. Oh, so this has been this has been published in the Grohe's New Letter of twenty twenty two. The what? The inner life landscape. Oh well, he gave it a new title. More than what I can think of is okay. Hold on. Hold on. I think he may have meant this one. I don't know, but yeah, I, I, but I called it inner landscape. That's what so I'm saying. Inner I, I think that's the one. Inner yes. landscape. Yes. I wrote that yes. here in Ojai in 2017, right. five right. years ago. Yes. And so, here, here goes. I, I like to, is it okay to read it? Yes, yes, please. Inner landscape. You have to climb the mountain, which is you yourself. Leave behind the habitations, the civilized arrangements of home and road. Invade the hidden, untamed wilderness, which has been there in silence from the beginning of time, closer at hand than perhaps the hand itself waiting patiently beyond and without time for time to run out or for the unexpected unsought onslaught of that innermost force the light which shone on the very first day and is shining still on the mountain range yet unexplored which is you yourself Thank you, thank you, Michael. Okay. And my sec my second request is if you could share some of your personal anecdotes with Krishnaji. <laughs> oh boy, there are so many, and uh, no, most of all, he was such a dear friend. Okay, I tell you, I tell you one anecdote which was actually just a day or two before he passed away. And he was here in the Pine Cottage in his room. And I'd asked Mary to see if I could say hello to him because we all knew it was close to the end. And she said, yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Pachwe is just giving him a massage. And he was lying on a on a platform of sorts and on his stomach. And there was Dr. Pachui giving him a massage on the back. And I said, Oh, Krishna Ji, I'm so sorry that you are in pain because it had become known that the pain from the disease, the cancer, was uh, causing him to, to weep sometimes. And so I, I, I told him I was really sorry that he had to suffer like that. And he said, oh, oh, so don't, yeah, don't talk about that. And, and then he said, and I'm so sorry that you have to cook for so many people <laughs> because there were guests from all over, from India, from Europe, from America, South America, who were you know, old friends and co collaborators who all had heard that Krishna Ji was close to the end and they wanted to come and say goodbye. And, and he had many meetings with them still. I mean, he came back here and, and prior to that, he was in India. You know, he was giving, we, we had an educational conference in, in Rishi Valley and then uh, moved to Madras or and now Chennai, um, and he gave talks there that I attended. 
but then uh, he was getting weaker and uh, he fell down a few times during his talks, uh, during his walks. And, um, and, and he was clearly uh, affected by the whole physical situation. And so, and Dr. Pache couldn't really analyze or determine what, he was, what bothered him. So he decided to cut short the talks in Madras, Chennai, which were, I think he had planned four talks, but he kept it down to three. And then he determined to cancel the talks in Bombay, Mumbai altogether, and to return to California because his main doctor, Dr. Deutsch was here in, in Santa Paula, 10 miles from him. And also he, want, he wanted to be close to Mary who was, you know, his companion in many ways and had looked after him so wonderfully. And so, and so he decided to do that, which caused me to shortcut my visit. Uh, and I had a flight to Germany to see my mother for a day and then continued to Los Angeles. And I was here, I think I got here January 6th and Krishnaji came January 11th, five days later, he came. And I think Scott Forbes had traveled with him and oh, and a, and a Japanese gentleman, uh, forgotten his name now, who joined the flight. And, and when the car arrived, he was, he was very fragile. I, I, he could hardly stand up or walk. And so then they quickly took him to the hospital and I diagnosed it. And it was pretty sad, you know, that because surgery, he was 90 years old or almost 91. And it was impossible for him to, to, uh, to have surgery and the pain was great. Then he allowed, at the urging of some of the people with him, he allowed morphine but to lessen the pain so he could still answer questions and talk with the participants. And then just, it was just a bit over a month, February 17th, 1986. He passed just after midnight and then was cremated and all that. So that was uh, a real, well, it was a mixed, mixed bag, I must say, because it was very sad and really deeply disturbing and painful to see him in such discomfort and pain. And he, and he never liked very much to be, to be taken care of and, and couldn't walk and all that. And so while he came back, he, they didn't keep him in Santa Paula, but brought him here because he didn't like to be in a hospital. And so he was here and had a nurse and a doc, the Dr. Deutsch came and looked after him pretty regularly. And then, and then that was that, you know. Uh, I mean, it was sad and painful to see him in such, uh, with such pain, you know, in such helplessness. But then, on the other hand, the ending was, well, that ended the sorrow, the pain, you know, and it's each human being's law to enter the life and to depart from life. You know? So that's our common lot, and everybody has to go along with that. And of course, it's best if we don't feel fear. So anyway, so th that was one thing. I mean, there were many episodes uh, that I describe in my book where he was, uh, I mean, I liked the jokes that he told and there were about, there must have been about 40 or 50 jokes that he had. Sometimes he repeated them, you know, and uh, well, you know the most famous one, I'll tell you the most famous one. This is my own version, it's not verbatim, which he told at the beginning of the Truth is a Pathless Land speech, where he dismissed the order or uh, dismissed the members of the Order of the Star you know, in 1929. 
and he left the order of the star and the Theosophical Society. And he started by saying, you may know the story where the devil and a friend of his are walking on the earth. And they see in front of them, they see a man stop and pick something up from the, from the ground. And he's delighted and he puts it into his pocket and walks away. The, it's almost a changed person. And the friend says to the devil, what did I did this man pick up that changed him so much that was so impressive? And the devil said to him, well, he picked up a piece of the truth. And then the friend said to the devil, well, that must be really bad for you then. But then the devil said, no, not at all. I'll help him organize it. <laughs> of course, Krishna Ji, as you know, he, he well, I mean, it's a, another one of these kind of contradi seeming contradictions. He found that he was dependent to some degree on an organization, you know, the Krishna Mori Foundation, you know, the, the bookstores, the, the, the printers, you know. And so it was always a balancing act. And, uh, but it wasn't, a, I mean, we still, we, we are not members of a religion or sect or cult. And that's why the teachings are so important that we figure out for ourselves. And that's the only way to figure out for oneself about life, this daily life that we go through. And there's no end to it. It's like the book of humanity, you know, it goes on until we, we leave, the, <laughs> we leave the, the, the scene <laughs> and maybe take the book with us, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But here, okay, I'd like to read you one, one more poem. <clears throat> and it's, And I wrote it in uh, uh, 1986, right after he died, and reworked it. And I called it Eulogy on the 48th Day. And I was a little bit influenced by the Tibetan Book of the Dead there. And so the, the eulogy on the 48th day goes like this. Did we ever know you? I hardly remember you. Who were you? Were you the lovely flower by the wayside of humanity? That's carrying stream. Whose fragrance permeated everything? Whose multi-petaled beauty opens to the limpid skies and to whoever cares to look and see? Who really were you? Eagle, whose majestic flight through blueness leaves no trace in eye or emptiness of ecstasy's triumphant movement. Who really were you? What was it your voice whose clarity cut deeply through the fetters of the mind and into the hearts of those listening? Yes, curious, I hardly recall you, as if your image never existed in my memory. Indeed, as if you were no more extinguished, gone beyond to another unmoved So, and then I did read, an, a, write another poem, but I won't, read that now because I think I'm out of time. Uh, and it was published in Evelyn Blau's 100 year book at the very end and it's called Thank You, Sir. Okay. So thank you, Mike. Thanks a lot uh, for being with us. I'll uh, now open it for people to ask something to Mr. Michael Conan. So if you have questions or comment to make, please raise your hand. Yes. Uh, Dr. Harshad Parikh, please unmute yourself. 
Yes. Are you able to hear my voice? Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm, I can hear it very clearly. Mm -hmm. Hello, Michael. Good morning. <laughs> nice Hi, to, good to see you. Nice again. to listen to you. Thank you. Uh, now, what I'm going to say, it is because I have come across Krishnamurti and uh, his first book, which I came across, I did not know who was he, but the questions he was asking, those questions I had not asked myself, and they were very, very relevant to my own life, daily life. And the question like, why do you think of yourself as a Hindu or an Indian? Because I was in America at that time. And so this question became very interesting. and. Uh, it became my question. And then I said, yes, we are all conditioned by our culture, by our religion. And then Krishnamurti was going deeper into how these problems arise in our daily life, like fear, anger, jealousy, loneliness. So he was showing the source from where everything arises. And that became very, very interesting for me to look, not so much reading Krishnamurti, but looking within myself. And I begin to see very, very clearly that everything is arising from thinking. And um, every time I try to look at the beginning of a thought, my mind used to become silent. And then it was a wonderful state where there is no problem, no sense of I or me. So this became the most important thing in my life. So when such a thing, when you want to look within yourself, not in order to become somebody, but it's very interesting to look inward, then these teachings of Prishamurti is it, it is possible to live Krishnamurti's teachings and it means looking at ourselves as we are without making effort. Why uh, not effort? Because it is very interesting. When something is very interesting to you, you don't feel that you are making an, any effort. So when learning about ourselves, it becomes very interesting, very enjoyable, then we don't need to read any other book also, not even Krishnamurti. And that is what I feel, that something is coming up moment by moment, and I'm very much interested. And it seems to me that we are not individual, we are connected to the whole humanity. And so mm -hmm. when Krishnaji says, you are a humanity, the story of humanity is inside you. I feel, yes, it is so. And also, of course, Indian philosophy also says that, that the whole world is a family, you know. So yeah. it is wonderful to come across Krishnamurti first time in 1970s, and then teaching in Krishnamurti schools and having dialogues with him so a new way, a new way of looking, listening, learning, living happened because of just one book of Krishnamurti, which opened a new way of living. So I have said enough. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, I agree with what you say. But at the same time, you can see the complexity of human of the human condition and that you see human beings nowadays also with a computer are so used to being told what to do you know they they want a, a solution they want to be told oh if you do this you'll be free or you do this you'll be enlightened you do this and you'll be happy forever and you know and of course we know that these kind of uh, demands or hopes are silly. You know, it just, it's not the way it's done. And I mean, he expresses it at the moment. 
you realize that none of it can be done consciously by desire. At that moment, you give up and you watch, as you said, you know, your daily life, which is the life of humanity, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have Mr. Pradeep Verma. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, sir. I'm audible, sir. Yes. Yeah, you can, I can hear you go well. Thank you. Uh -huh. so, Michael and hello all the friends. Michael having a good grounding in world's prime religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Zen, Taoism, with their rites and rituals. And on top of it, a close association with a seer like Krishnamurti. What is your understanding about time? I mean, Michael's time, psychological time and daily <laughs> life. That is my first question. Another simple but profound question is, what is the role of food in human life? What is your gut feeling, Michael? Since you have used a lot of your prime energy as a chef, <laughs> tell us the role of tasty food and awakening of intelligence. <laughs> yes. well, that's all connected, yeah. Well, of course, I learned, you know, I never cooked before. And <laughs> I learned how to prepare food uh, with the help of a man who had a famous restaurant. You may have heard his name, Alan Hooker. He and his wife used to come to or go to India to hear him speak. And they were here because of Krishna Ji. And they taught me uh, how to cook. And so that was, I, I felt uh, at the time, I felt, well, it was a challenge for one because I never imagined or envisioned that I would be doing something like this. All that I'd done until then was, well, I'd gone to college briefly. I loved traveling. I wrote poetry and painted pictures. And I was very interested in religions and Krishna Ji, you know. So suddenly here I'm starting almost at the bottom because food is the most essential thing in our lives in a practical manner without food. Well, actually some people, I've heard this, uh, uh, it's almost like they determined to end their lives by not eating, you know? And, and that happens, you know, you, you stop, you stop uh, eating and, and suddenly eventually you, you weaken and then you die. You know, it's clear. So, uh, so anyway, so food was of the essence. And of course, the one thing that I cherished more than anything else in it, because it wasn't, I wasn't just cooking for Krishna Ji. I mean, for Krishna Ji, it was three months out of the year here, February through May. The rest of the time, I was uh, uh, cooking for the people at the school, you know, the students and the staff. And I was doing a little teaching, world history. And that was it, you know. I mean, that was okay too, but I have to tell you, uh, and actually that's what happened. For 11 years, I stuck with it. And, um, and, and it was such a blessing to be close to Krishna Ji for these three months every day to meet him, interact with him. And, and also attend his talks and dialogues and all that. And, and then he passed away. And suddenly there I was. Actually, they wanted me to be a full-time teacher, but the age group didn't work out for me. There were younger people, and I wasn't qualified to teach them. So, And I didn't want to continue being a, a chef at the school. So I gave up my job. And I wanted to travel. And I did. I went to, did a long trip of South America, and I went to the various Krishnamurti centers and gave some presentations, made some friends with quite a few people there. And I'd met most of them before. And, but that was the end. Well, I actually, when I returned, I mean, I kept my residency in Ojai, and I kept my connection to the foundation with a job, which then, since I, I only cooked on very special occasions for the trustees. And then 
and then uh, did office work, you know, computer and office work. And uh, then I became her librarian, you know, after some time, which was something I was very pleased with. And also during the time that I, that I did this traveling, which was close to 10 years, I wrote this book, you know, I wrote my book. I took that time to, and then I was fortunate enough that Mark Lee, whom you may know, uh, he published it and he published a series of books. But that was really a wonderful circumstance because it was difficult to find a publisher. You know? So yeah. And so uh, it opened this wonderful door to me. Uh, and But now, let's, let's just say now, I've been now librarian and I'm night manager at our guest house for over 20 years, but now, how much cooking do I do? I did a little bit for a while, but now, well, I make, here's my dinner plan. It's a salad with some dressing and it's a sandwich with avocado and grilled cheese. And that's it, right? And that's only for myself. And I, you know, I, it's okay. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't miss cooking. You know, actually it became, and actually, here's another feature about food and cooking in America. And maybe it's just to some degree the same in, in India, is people have all these special, uh, not only special demands, but also all this stuff that they don't want to eat and digest, you know, like uh, uh, salt or sugar or uh, uh, what's the thing in, in, in wheat? Um, um, what's the this, this, this ingredient in wheat that they don't want to eat. You know? Carbo carbohydrate? Well, it's not carbohydrate, it, but it's a particular, uh, uh, it'll come to me. But anyways, so there are all these uh, uh, limitations and demands that people, you know, have, adhere to. And it's very hard to cook something that pleases everybody. For Krishna Ji, well, I was cooking with wheat. Uh, I was cooking with eggs and cheese to a certain degree, minimal, you know, because I knew Krishna Ji, he ate it, but he didn't want to eat a lot, you know. Or, or, or here, here's the funny thing about, since you asked me also about funny uh, episodes with Krishna Ji. So he had, he, uh, when he was in Europe, he uh, uh, went sometimes to special places to be uh, tested physically. And so he came back and he entered the kitchen and he, and he said to me, no more desserts, sir. And I, and I was shocked because <laughs> I knew that he, he used to love sweet things, cookies, ice cream and so on. And I made these desserts, you know, and uh, he said, no more dessert. I said, why Krishna Ji? He said, well, he's got old age diabetes, you know. So the doctor told him not to eat anything sweet. And I said, okay, well, I'll... and but, but, but then he added, but still, you know, for the other people, you have to make dessert, you know, not just because of me. I said, all right, sir, I'll do that. <laughs> and then, oh, and then prior to that, there was a funny thing because I was always walking. Krishna Ji let all the other people walk in front of him to help themselves. And there were always 10 or 20 guests. And, and it was buffet style, you help yourself. And I was walking behind Krishna Ji and he would say, oh, what is this? And, you, you know, and I told him what it is. And he liked, he liked uh, as I said, dessert, sweet things. And I prepared what I call chocolate brownie, you know, a dish of chocolate brownies. And, and he was looking at it and he said, what is that, sir? Oh, and I thought I would really please him. I said, chocolate brownies, Krishnaji. And he said, oh, I won't eat those. And I was shocked. And I said, 
but Krishnaji, I thought you liked dessert and sweet things. And he, at that time, he said, no, I can't eat chocolate. Chocolate is a stimulant. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't eat chocolate. He wouldn't eat chocolate brownies. <laughs> and yeah, and okay. I don't know. Did I, I don't know if I answered your whole question or not. Uh, uh, I think we'll, we'll go to, to Durgaji now. She has raised her hand. Yes, Durgaji. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Good morning, uh, Michael. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, I can hear you well. Thank yeah, it's, uh, you. It's lovely, lovely listening to you. Wonderful uh -huh. uh, seeing you. And uh, it's a beautiful journey of, you know, wonderful poems. You really made our Thank day. You. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just would like to contribute to one or two things, you know, that uh, struck me. Uh -huh. Yeah, you are speaking about the paradoxes of life. Uh -huh. Yeah, initially you said that, you know, uh, that thanks to the technology. So we are all uh, remaining connected. So it's a miracle. It's uh, a miracle. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, Krishnaji used to give a lot of warnings also. How oh, the exactly. machines are going to take over, oh. and uh, I think uh, that kind of a warning signals we do come across in Krishna's teachings. You know, where man is going to lose all his innate abilities, he's going to become uh, lazy, and you know, uh, it, it's already started happening to us. Oh, we, I, I uh, see it. Sorry, but I see it. Yeah. You know, I drive to Ventura on the beach. That's my walk, yeah. and I see young people. Exactly. Small children, and they have their little iPhone and they're playing with it and all that. And yeah. it starts so early, you know. Exactly. And it's a Nowadays, conditioning force. Either the, you, you take the smallest of the kids and do the, to the eldest of the people, all of them are glued to their gadgets exactly. and uh, no love for nature, no looking yeah. around at all. Exactly. So these are the very dangers also. So I yeah. think these are all kind of. You know, paradoxes of life we see all around. And this is like walking on the kind of a razor's edge, you know. You yeah. enjoy it also, you see the dangers of it also. So maybe I think Krishnaji makes us think about all these things. Definitely. Think about all these things, reflect on all these things. Yeah, that part I, just, I thought I just would like to say. Mm. And uh, yeah, <laughs> looking at your life, uh, Michael, it's, it's such a wonderful life you live. You are the most privileged person. Uh, to nourish the world teacher. <laughs> <To be nourished. laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the world teacher. It's the most beautiful life and uh, privileged life. I just would like to ask you one question. Uh, sure. When you look back at your own life, do you feel, you must be feeling the same, I'm quite sure. So do you also feel you fulfilled? Uh, it's an um, extraordinary life you have got. Uh, fulfilled, rich, contented, satisfied. Do you feel that way? I just would like to I ask feel you. very great. I mean, I'm getting old, you know. I don't know if you know how old I am. Guess how old I am. No, no, we, we can't guess. You look so young. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, one year, I'm one year away from 80. Oh, yeah. you don't look like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But anyways, so that makes me look back on my life, yeah. you know, how things happen. and. I'm profoundly grateful and feel blessed for the way things happen. And a lot of it, and I often say that to people, it's, it's a form of, there's a word for it, it's serendipity, you know, it's a chance. Most of the real good things, I mean, discovering Krishna Ji, it was a chance, you know, then to meet him was chance. And and I mean, then becoming his cook, a chance thing, how never cooked before, you know? So, so I mean, there were so many, I mean, you give it many names, coincidences, uh, chance, uh, good fortune, you know? And it was, and, and, and I look back, yes, I mean, I made a lot of mistakes in my life too, and uh, all that, I can look at that and say, well, but the way it all unfolded was, uh, I felt blessed and, and really grateful and thankful, particularly 
the contact and working with Krishna Ji, that was the most important thing. And hearing all over the world, you know, India and Europe and here. Yeah. And he was, well, I often when I describe him to people who never heard of him, I call him the Buddha of our time, you know, just to give him a uh, to give a comparison of sorts, even though he himself never wanted to be compared, you know, I know that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I think we have another hand raised. Ansaji, please go ahead. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste, Namaste Michael. You are a very multi, multi talented personality, and it's nice to see you, listen to you. Um, I just want to know uh, how you feel the presence of J. Krishnamurti Ji. I just want to know how you feel because um, we we are not um, uh, we do we are not able to see him personally. But uh, uh, I just want to know what are the what what you ch feel the change in mm. you also in the presence of Jai Krishnamurti. Okay, now one thing was that, first of all, here were his teachings, which was something extraordinary for me. You know, I I had been raised as a Catholic as a, in, in my younger life, in my family, and I wanted to be a priest, a monk. You know, I had a very religious mindset, but then, as I got to be teenager, there were so many contradictions in, 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 in Christianity, you know, the, looking at the history and the whole the hierarchical setup and all that stuff. And, and I came to the point of just throwing it away, saying, no, it doesn't make sense. And I left that and became very interested in in uh, Asian uh, religions that fascinated me, Buddhism, Taoism, Hinduism, and so on, you know, and not that I wanted, well, I mean, meditation was an interesting uh, uh, activity, you know, that I uh, was engaged in. And then, because I lived in San Francisco when all this happened, uh, and there was, San Francisco was a center of, multi-ethnical groups and many different religions, you know, it was a perfect place for learning about this. And then discovering Krishna G, who seemed to be directly speaking about the fact, you know, and then being fortunate enough, you know, I, I discovered him in 1966, 67, but I didn't meet him until nine, early 1971 in, in, in Chennai, in, in my house, you know. But all this while, I was studying all these things. They interested me. But then to meet him in person was such a powerful, wonderful thing. You know, he was already 75 years old. And, but his presence, I call it his presence, his personality. And it wasn't... Um, powerfully obstructive or assertive, you know, it wasn't self-assertive, but it was very gentle, very quiet. And it was something just extraordinary to see this man and the way he talked and so on, you know. I mean, just to give you an example, I'd never heard him before. He was meeting in uh, Madras. He was, this was still the time when Vasanta Vihar, where now the headquarters is, was still under litigation. And this property here was still under litigation. You know, there was this long legal thing. And when Krishnaji went to Madras, he stayed at the house of this lady uh, who was, I think, an architect by training and uh, profession. Her name was Yaya Lakshmi. And she lived on the same road that the Vasanta Vihar is located on, Greenways Road, not too far from Adaya. And uh, that's where he spoke. And that's, uh, there was this meeting that again, by two, pure chance, I was invited to it. And, uh, and it was a, a, a dialogue with young people. 
And there he was, sitting in the corner on, on a pillow, looking at all the young people. And there were mostly Indian young people, but some Westerners, and I was one of the Westerners. I sat way in the back because I'm too big, I would obstruct the view. And so, and so he, he, he started by looking at everybody very quietly and with a smile, uh, that smile of affection in his face. And it was true affection. And he looked at everybody and then said, what shall we talk about? And then people raised questions and he was able to combine them and start them. And then as it went on, I, I hadn't said anything. I didn't feel capable. But at one point, I think, and I'm really, I don't even know if my memory is accurate in that sense. But as I remember it, he asked something along the line of, so what can we do to overcome fear and live happily without conflict? And nobody was saying everything, anything, and they were all pondering. And I, and someone blurted out of me, you know, and I said, through meditation, sir. <laughs> and he was startled by my voice. And he finally, he figured out where I was. And he looked at me and he smiled a little bit. And then he said, no, darling. <laughs> 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 it was it was both a rebuttal and at the same time something very sweet and <laughs> yeah thank you thank you michael we have another hand raised mr prasad please i think it's not with uh, mr prasad bunpuri somebody yeah hi. yeah hello sir are you able to hear me oh hello yeah can you hear yes. me yes yes yeah hi sir. Uh, namaste, sir. This is Prasad. Uh, uh, I read your book and it's very interesting and very pleasant one uh, with no heavy philosophy, but with light events and jokes and all. So I cherished reading that book uh, a lot. So from that, I just want to bring up one instant of yours, like, uh, which is like the one you told right now, like, mm -hmm. And I would like to know the comments from you. Uh, somewhere you went to his guest house and you have given some uh, great explanation like the brain neurosis and everything. And uh, he turned to you and he said, find out, find <laughs> out sir, something like yes, that. Yes, I remember that. <laughs> and, and it was uh, in Malibu actually, Mary Zimbalist. Ah, house. Malibu, yeah, yeah, right. right he was yeah. staying there at the time. And, yeah. and I, at that time, this was before I settled in Ojai. I was mostly traveling around. And I lived, at that time, I lived in, uh, in Los Angeles. And I, I didn't have a car even. Uh, and I hitchhiked, you know. And I, somehow I found out where he was staying. So I went and I wanted to meet him personally. And I had met him and we had had short interaction in Vichy Valley and in some other Indian places. And, but this time I, I, I somehow, I had a urge to see him and just say hello to him. So I went to this house and rang the bell and there was the, the, the cook or keeper of the house. Uh, she opened the door and said, uh, I asked this, does Krishnamurti live here? And she said, oh, yes, come on in. And I said, can I maybe see him, we'll talk to him for just a bit? And she said, OK, I'll check. And she went uh, into the house. And, uh, and then uh, a, a moment later, Krishnaji came you know, and very cordially he, he grabbed my arms and said, hello, sir, how are you? Come on in. And so I walked with him. And, and I and I didn't really have a question. I always felt that in his talks he covered everything, you know, and there was very little left for me to ask. You know? So, uh, so, so then he kind of turned to me and said, "Yes, so uh, wh what is it?" You know, and I said, "Well, I'm here now, and I heard you in Santa Monica, and and I wonder, sir, 
do you think the thought process is connected to the movement of electrons in the brain? <laughs> And then he said what you were just quoting. He said, he gave it just a moment. And then he said, find out. <laughs> 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 and then he asked me, uh, do you drink coffee? I said, yes. And then he told the lady, the, uh, the housekeeper, uh, make him some coffee. And then he said to me, goodbye, sir. <laughs> and he walked away. <laughs> Yeah, those were the encounters. I mean, uh, so many of them, they were always very affectionate and very unusual, yeah. Uh, we have come to the end of the talk now. Uh, it's almost one and a half hours now. So I think I'll close it here. And uh, I want to thank Mike for being with us and uh, spending his time with us and uh, sharing his experiences of and his poems, which is always a pleasure to hear. Uh, so maybe sometimes in future, we'll invite Michael again for interaction with us. Next Sunday, we'll have uh, Mr. Rajendra Sharma, who will be talking to us at 11 a.m. And the theme is five misconceptions about the self. So mm -hmm. it's okay, five misconceptions about the self. So if you are free, please do join. With these words, I want to thank Michael once again. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. And thank you, all of you, for listening you. to this man. <laughs> all the best. Thank Much you. luck. And oh, and in America, we have the this coming week, Thursday, it's Thanksgiving, big day. So okay. thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Be blessed. Thank, thank you, Dubeji. Thank you. Come there, please end it now. Unless please end it. Thank you. Right. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye.